This show is brought to you by Ridley College. Hi, I'm Scott Harrower. Hi, I'm Mike Bird, and welcome to the now and the not yet. Now, originally we we're going to call this show the Naked Theologians. However, we had a event, a discussion with the Unitarian, and it did not go very well. So we had to opt on a different name, and we've got the now and the not yet. Yes, on a more serious note, we thought this reflected Jesus' teaching on the kingdom of God. Uh, it's a kingdom that's begun, but it's not fully yet consummated in history. It also means we can have coffee mugs with NNY painted across it for now and not yet. Or it could be something else like the new New York. Right, excellent, yeah. Or naked in New York. If you're inclined to that during July in the hotter months, maybe. You know, the first time uh, I met you, you were semi-naked at least. I, I uh, was at a conference and I accidentally walked in on Mike when he was trying to sleep. Uh, that did not end very well, did it? Well, you don't, you don't, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't mess with a hibernating bear, Scott. <laughs> don't mess with a hibernating bear because he is never going to wake up in a good mood. On a more serious note, in this show we're going to be talking about biblical studies, historical studies, theological studies, and thinking through culture. We're also going to be having a whole bunch of fun, so I'm hoping that you're going to join us. It's going to be quite a wild ride. Hot off the press. Welcome to Hot Off The Press. We have Mike Bird's new commentary on Romans. We're going to be discussing it, but I understand, Mike, that you got through this writing process without coffee. How does that work? I hate coffee, Scott. I mean, I really, really hate coffee. I hate coffee. I hate coffee like Donald Trump hates Megyn Kelly. I you hate coffee. I really, really hate coffee. <laughs> I really hate coffee. I will not kiss my wife after she's had coffee. Oh, oh, okay, you really hate coffee. Mike has written a whole bunch of books in New Testament studies and in theology. Most recently, his Evangelical Theology, which has sold really well and been very well received by my own students. This is Mike's latest book. Mike, tell us, uh, what makes this series unique? It's uh, the Story of God Bible com Commentary series is unique in three ways. Yeah. We have a section where you read the text, where you explain the text, and then you live the story. So it's got a, a good format of, you know, Bible, exegesis, and application. Okay, so this sounds to me like it's actually a helpful book for people that would be leading small groups, would be church leaders, and also for preachers? That's exactly right. The book is designed for pastors, those who are going to be using the text, not just for study, but for an actual explanation and telling people how this text can shape the story of their own lives. So particularly in this commentary series, what does Romans have to say to do with sanctification? I think it's got a number of things. One of the things that really struck me when I was working on this commentary is how Paul sees his ministry as to take these former idol-worshipping, sexually immoral, pork-sandwich-eating Gentiles and sanctify them, consecrate them, bring them to the obedience of faith and offer them up to God as his own sacrifice. Yeah. And, and th th that's Paul's job. That's his priestly ministry in the gospel. And that needs to be ours as well. Taking whatever group of people that we're looking after, whether it's a ladies' Bible study group, or a church or a youth group and bringing them to God, bringing them uh, as a holy sacrifice pleasing to Him. Now one of the big issues in Romans is um, our own struggle with sin and what Romans 7 has to say. Um, is Romans 7 describing the experience of a Christian who um, goes through massive ups and downs? What, what's going on there? That's been a very popular position um, since Augustine. But I am fully persuaded that the wretched man of Romans 7 is not a Christian. He has to be a pre-Christian. Because Romans 7, sandwiched where it is between Romans 6 and Romans 8, I think only makes sense if the person is a, a non-Christian, a pre-Christian. Because in Romans 6, we know that Christians are no longer a slave to sin, but the guy in Romans 7 is. Mm -hmm. And when you get into real sanctification in Romans 8, you've got the help of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, no right. mention of the Holy Spirit in Romans 7. Yeah. So I think there is, I'll say it very strongly and I'll overstate it, I'll say I don't think there's any way the guy in Romans 7 can be a Christian. All right, well, thanks for making that clear, Mike. This sounds like a great book to me, guys. This is Mike Bird's commentary on Romans, and it's available for you now. I highly recommend it. 
So go to wherever good books are sold or click on the link below and you can get one for yourself for the service of those around you. <laughs> now we move to a segment called Yoda One For Me. Mike, you're a Star Wars fan, aren't you? I certainly am. Now, I know that because whenever I walk into your study, I come across the shrine. Yes, I have a Star Wars shrine. What's in the shrine? Uh, basically a bunch of Star Wars toy figures, birthday cards, and various memorabilia like, you know, Star Wars coffee mugs and pencils. So anyhow, we're both Star Wars fans. And so my wife, for our anniversary, gave me this card. Yoda won for me. Isn't that great? So we thought we'd have a yeah. little segment yep. called Yoda One For Me, in which we send out some love to a particular person in our lives, somebody we admire. They might be a theologian, a church leader, some great person to whom we're saying, Yoda One For Me. So uh, you had somebody in mind. I had Justin Welby in mind. Justin the Welby. Ar the Archbishop of Canterbury. Let's send some love out to Welby. Why are we sending some love to Welby, Scott? Well, he, he seems to me like he's a great leader who believes in the God of the risen Christ. Yeah. So he's somebody who's wanting to walk with the power of Christ, strengthening the communion, bringing us together. And very recently, he's been involved in a number of projects that have really kept the Anglican Church and its voice close to the centre of European society through England. I think it would have been very easy for him to back right down and come under pressure and say that the Anglican Church has nothing distinctive to contribute and he could have offered a very watered down version of Christianity, but he didn't. No. So um, I'm very proud of him. I'd like to say Yoda one for me. Yeah, I think we can say to Welby, Yoda one for me, uh, keep on gospelizing. Keep on doing that Anglican thing that you do, and uh, God bless you and keep you in all that you do. Yeah, and we're right with you, brother. The first one is by Thomas McCall, yep. who's really at the forefront of what's known as analytic theology today. And this is a form of theology um, that comes out of England and the States that it really prizes clarity yep. and has a very uh, clear tone about it. And it wants to line up claims, make sure that they're irreducible, that there's no fluff, and then seeks to draw them together in a very thoughtful manner. Tom McCall describes what analytic theology is all about, drawing on a range of literature that's been coming out from people like Oliver Crisp. Ah, yeah. yeah. Old Ollie. Yeah, yeah, good old Ollie. And uh, does he still have a beard? No, no. Oh, I used oh. to call him Father Olopolis. Okay, okay. I love Ollie. If he buffed up, he could be the new James Bond. He, he could. He does. He's got a charming English accent. He's very tall. Yeah, I would like to see that happen. Because da Daniel Craig will be retiring soon from James <laughs> Bond. <laughs> Maybe we need to start a petition to get Oliver Crisp nominated as the new James Bond. But perhaps he's wasted on James Bond. You know, he's a great artist. Yeah, he, he is. He should be the new Picasso. I can see him on a bad day, Oliver. I can see you going all Picasso on me. Drawing out the Minotaur, going through a blue that phase. That is a new verb I have not heard. Someone going Picasso on me. <laughs> You've got to see it. I've seen it. Well, okay. Oliver, I, know, I know Oliver's into analytic theology. and He's got a big grant for Fuller Seminary, hasn't he, to do a whole bunch of this. That's right. So that's why this book is a very important book for you to read. Because what Tom McCall does for you is he gives you a concise summary of the movement and then very helpfully applies some analytic theology to a number of issues that are core in Christianity and are contentious issues. And remember, he's trying to bring clarity to these issues. This is a very helpful book. You can see I've marked it up. Um, it's very, very stimulating. So well done, Tom. Fantastic book. And I recommend this to all my students oh, um, to include within their method. Okay, so this is good for an idiot's guide to analytic theology. Yeah, it absolutely Because analytic theology is one of the cool, sexy, hip it things is, happening. It is, man. And you won't be an idiot by the time you're finished with well, this. That is awesome. Yeah, because you'll be able to say counterfactual. Well, it, well it <laughs> sounds like even I might have to read it. <laughs> but now and not yet. And that's the show for this week. It's been a great show. We've talked about Romans. Justin Welby, analytic theology. It's been great. Next week, we're doing mentoring. We're also going to be looking at Kevin Van Hoos' new book. We're going to be sending some love out to someone. Could be you. 
Feel free to post comments or ask questions. Subscribe to the show. You can also like Ridley College's Facebook page and follow us on social media like Twitter for more laughs, news and reviews. I'm Scott Harrower. I'm Mike Bird. And this is the Now and Not Yet Show. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>